And so, you know, uh, we have uh, this doctrine of the divine impassibility, right? right? The orthodox position, he tells us, of the early church, uniformly held to the impassibility of God, the belief that God, as God, does not experience suffering. So notice, we're, 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 I mean, we're starting to get in trouble here, right? We have, does God really die? Can God really experience suffering, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, the orthodox position was, no, God does not experience suffering. But if God does not suffer, does he not experience, does he not experience emotions either, mm-hmm. right? And, and if not, he asks, how can he even sympathize with our suffering? So, and yet the scriptures clearly indicate as we read in, in the book of Hebrews that, you know, God identifies right. with our suffering. Yeah. And so he tells us that the contemporary discussion of this matter uh, have uh, generated a great deal of confusion and controversy with uh, many Christians rejecting, uh, you know, the impassibility of God for a passable God. Right. right? One right. that can suffer. Right. It makes, it makes it easier. It makes <laughs> makes the math easier there. That's right. However, the rejection of impassibility is based on significant misunderstandings of what the doctrine teaches. Mm. The view espoused by classic orthodox theism says that God does not suffer, but that this does not mean that he is apathetic without feeling or compassion for others who suffer. The patristic writers made a strong distinction between two terms to describe mental states that have taken on entirely different meanings today, mm. affections and passions. Mm. Classical theism holds that God experiences affections, but not passions. All right, good. So this is going to help us in terms of working through this particular Very much so. And this right. is one of those things where the, the, mm. the uh, you know, the acronistic um, understanding when, when we, when we as Western uh, readers read back into into you know these Near East uh, 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 writers, and we ascribe the same meaning to, to that we do today, not realizing definitions change and yeah. we use words differently. Literally, what always happens <laughs> is what literally changes in definition form too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have this distinction here that he wants us to be aware of, right, of affections and passions. He says passions uh, in the older theology uh, are confined to human experience and indicate disordered, unruly, and often sinful uh, mental states, emotions, yeah. Yeah. right? Weeping uh, and gnashing of teeth, yeah. passions. Yeah. They are involuntary, right, passive, and um, their involuntary uh, disturbances caused by outside forces that overpower the mind and thus tend toward the irrational, unstable, and unpredictable. Mm-hmm. Right. So passions reflect the mutable, that is, changing conditions of creatures under the power of both a finite and sinful natures. Thus, in this sense, God is without passion. Right. 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 Just <clears throat> uncontrolled. So yeah. Uh, that's that's kind of what we would come to expect from from God is is an uncontrolled aspect. Uh, uh, you know, God is a jealous God. Well, he's not sitting there, and he all of a sudden learns that uh, you know the the Israelites have gone off to foreign gods, and he goes, "I'm going to take them out." All of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, yeah. it, he, he's he's not one to to have have new information revealed to him that flips the switch into to you know droll or happiness to <laughs> to anger and pain. <clears throat> However, on the other hand, God does have affections. He is Mm. affectionate. In classical orthodox, affections refer to voluntarily, self-controlled, rational, stable, predictable dispositions of the soul. Mm. Conversely, passions represent alterations to the soul, but God cannot be moved either negatively or positively by people, things, and events. He doesn't doesn't react to that. Uh, in the sense that his uh, self-sufficient dispositions are not dependent on the actions of others. Again, God is not carried along in the the confines of time and, uh, uh, you know, c- comes up to the Holocaust and is aghast at what, what goes on. Yeah, and, yeah. and Surprise, and so he has to react and get angry right. and whatever. But right. we can also see where this kind of muddled things come from if you... Uh, if, if you're reading scripture again from from maybe a, a Western perspective and we see the Tower of Babel being built and uh, God seems to go, hmm, let us go down and, and, and view these, uh, you know, things or, or uh, you know, the, the evil has conflated so much that God all of a sudden seems to want to wipe out humanity and he, he rejects his idea of even creating mankind. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, if he does that, why does he say no? And yeah. so we yeah. have to we have to understand that we're we're not reading a, a, a two minded God here. We're not reading a God who suddenly switches. We 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 allow God to to have this this characteristic of humanity in order to c- communicate with us. Uh, and so he does so in a language that uh, that we can understand. So exactly. he l- allows Moses to be the an intercessor for his people, and again uh, have have a a, uh, a a positive image here that that then is uh, uh, carried over into especially the the incarnation itself. And so he is not surprised by what he already knows and has decreed from all eternity. Mm-hmm. Again, he, uh, he he's not surprised by the, the 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 worst thing that happened in all of humanity was the 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 death of Jesus Christ, the most perfect person that ever lives, the 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 only true person that ever faced a trial that was completely one hundred percent not guilty of all things. <laughs> and so he's not surprised that the cross happened. That was the whole point and all the preceding points leading to that. And from that point to the end, how can God declare that, uh, that, uh, uh, death and Hades will be, uh, uh, death and suffering will be thrown into Hades and, Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, the devil and his kind will, will be defeated. How can he know that if he's all of a sudden surprised by, uh, yeah, you know, the world trade center bombing or, 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 uh, you know, uh, uh, world war II. God hopes yeah. that the devil he, he will be He crossed his fingers and, and, and gritted his teeth well. Yeah. 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 So again, if 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 you are to believe in prophecy, you know, from uh, from the, the the preceding this point onward or from our future uh point of view backwards, uh you have to believe that that God has these these affections, but not these these passions. Exactly. So this with this distinction, then affections and passions, uh, you know, God is affection has affections, but this doesn't mean that God, uh, Christensen tells us, is you know kind of stoic and impersonal, <laughs> aloof, Spock. unfeeling, yeah. right? That kind of stuff, mm-hmm. right? Rather, it means that the mental states of God, that is the uh, intrinsic to his internal trinitarian being, right, are perfect and perfectly poised. Right. Uh, thus, God's uh, t- temporal responses to actions are appropriately and precisely measured and known from all eternity, having proceeded from his eternal nature and what he has decreed. So when scripture speaks of God's responses of love or hate, uh, uh, compassion or anger, joy or grief, and so forth, these reflect, Christensen tells us, his eternal and corruptible righteous character. And this is where like open theists tend to take it and run for the field goal and say, "Oh, see, God's love. Therefore, you know, he's he's able to change and he falls out of love with people and uh, he experiences love in different degrees and in certain time periods. So, therefore, God's subject to time, and so he's carried along by time too." Ooh, okay, let's let's move on. <laughs> okay, but to to understand what all of Scripture is teaching, this isn't decrees from from a, count, a church council because. You know that they were they were you know th- throwing dice and and if it came up even they would go this way or it wasn't the the might makes right type deal. This was a discussion uh, f- founded on on what's found in scripture that's then carried on through our human uh, expression of language and understanding. And again, uh, I think we uh, talked about it a little bit over the past couple episodes. Is the the time and place when these councils took place? Uh, you had kind of the 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 Greek. Uh, a philosophy that came out. You you had Rome that perpetuated and and expanded it into uh, a lot of the known world, and we had terms that we didn't have before that helped us kind of to understand these these thought processes of of, of understanding uh, uh, you know being in person, and and that's why those councils kind of reflect that terminology, and that's why we also have to read um, from their perspective what that language uh, means there. 